Namaste, good morning, and welcome to the seventh episode of Pursuit of Excellence. We are back with the show that puts the spotlight on some amazing Indian leaders and their success stories in South Africa. And as it is August, the celebrated Women's Month here in South Africa, we thought there could be nothing better than bringing to you an inspiring female leader today. We have with us today, Dr. Dipshita Padalkar and Mr. Atul Padalkar, founders of BizFarm, a business and entrepreneurship facilitator firm. Dipshita Padalkar, director of BizFarm, is an industrial economist with a PhD in clothing and textiles. Mr. Adul, Atul Padalkar, CEO of BizFarm, holds a BSc in chemistry and a master's in marketing. He has international marketing experience in companies like Colgate, Palmolive, and others. Together at BizFarm, they assist entrepreneurs and small medium enterprises in crossing the hurdles and tasting success. BizFarm is a business incubator company started in 2010. It offers aspiring entrepreneurs access to finance, skills, and affordable workplaces, all under one roof as a comprehensive solution. The company operates specifically in the sectors of manufacturing and digital marketing. To give full credit to BizFarm's founders, BizFarm operates without any sort of government funding and is 52% staff owned. There is so much more to talk about when it comes to Dr. Dipshita and Mr. Atul's individual and combined achievements, including their work with top South African universities. But it's, it is best that we get all further information from the Padalkar power couple itself. So welcome Dr. Dipshita and Mr. Atul. How are you doing today? Thank you, Sally. Very fine. Yeah, absolutely. It's a fantastic, uh, we're just on the corner of the weekend, so we're pretty good. That's great. So should we start with the questions? Yeah, of course. It would be nice to have this conversation. Perfect. So let's start with the basics. As the founders and directors of BizFarm, you have been living in South Africa for a really long time. How is your overall experience of SA so far? South Africans of all walks of life have been extremely hospitable, welcoming, and they're always willing to engage in a clean and rational way. It's been a very positive experience. And South Africa is a beautiful rainbow nation, very protective and conserving of their natural beauty. That's great. And um, number two, uh, sir, you can also contribute, even though it is spotlight on your wife today. Um, from working with corporates to starting an incubation center, what drove your transition? Tell us a bit about your journey. Well, I'm going back to the times when I was working for a corporate and it was nice in a way that, you know, you had the freedom and flexibility and an assured salary and all the nice perks that corporates come up with. But um, in, after 9-11, when our business decided that, you know, they wanted to close down the operations here, I had the option to go back to India. But I think that was a time when the real estate market was pretty good. The family was very well settled. And we said to ourselves that, come on, we've seen this country here for the last few years, which was about six or seven years by then. And we said, can we give it a shot and see how we can contribute to this country and, and find a, a new beginning for ourselves? The option to go back home was always open, it's still open. So we said, let's get started. And uh, we decided to set up a company. And the easiest way for us to set up a company was to find a name which was absolutely unique. And that was Dr. Padalka's Research Resources, because we knew that nobody else would probably have that name. Uh, so at the first shot, we were able to get the company name and the registration sorted out. Then after that, uh, ensued all the formalities. We had to apply uh, for a new visa. Because at that time I was an employee, now I had to be an independent person. So we applied for an investor visa and we said to the government that we are bringing a large amount of intellectual capital and this is how we can create jobs. And they kind of saw some sense in what we were offering. So that was our real transition, I would say, from being an employee to becoming an entrepreneur. And it was an absolutely, uh, I would say, a clear mind shift because, you know, earlier, the tea and coffee was there in the office. A lot of facilities and support structure was there. But when you're on your own, you have to manage your time extremely judiciously. And I think that was a fantastic transition. We still remember those days. 
And uh, it's not easy from being an employee to become an entrepreneur. So we, we experienced that journey firsthand. And I would say going back, it was an amazing journey. How we managed it, looking back, it's a, I mean, it's a little bit surprising in some ways, I would say. Yeah. That's amazing. Ma'am, would you like to add to that? Because you are the intellectual property he was talking about, <laughs> the intellectual force behind it. So it's been an extremely joint effort, but what we, I would like to add is that we came in as independent professionals. He as an expat myself on my uh, skills permit. And then moving on the, to the, as an investors, it was a gradual incremental change. And I think the democratic uh, and progressive outlook that we were able to bring from our own offices uh, informed our decision making. So we all love to our growing up years in Bombay uh, in terms of our adjustments and adaptability here. The structural shifts in mindset were also made possible because of the fact that we were looking at long term sustainability. And uh, there was an element of gradualism and deep dive. I think that's what we need to uh, remember that it's not sudden, but at the same time, it's not only gradual. There has to be a risk taking element. And uh, add to that, if you are uh, the, the, the Indian ethos, um, See, we are in the we are in the land where we sow the seeds of Gandhian ideology to recognize the links there and be able to contribute in a global economic climate which was rapidly changing uh, was a very nuanced uh, approach that uh, one had to take. Wow, that was comprehensive. Thank you. So, next question. When you first came to South Africa, what were your expectations and how did you find SA to be in reality? Did it match your expectations? Did it fall short? Did it exceed it? We want to know it all. <laughs> well, for me, it was an absolutely interesting experience. You know, I, I remember somewhere around in May 1997, I took off from Mumbai airport. It was May, so it was very hot. I was just wearing a simple t-shirt. When I landed in Yangsmuts International Airport, I figured out that the temperature outside was zero degrees already. And it was a cold morning. The, the SAA flights used to land at 7.30 in the morning and it was absolutely freezing. Little did I realize at that stage that, you know, I was in the Southern Hemisphere and I was supposed to have expected a winter. So that was the beginning of a complete roller coaster of adapting. My expectation was that the airport would have been like an indoor or a Bhopal kind of an airport of those days. And I was amazed to see a fantastic world-class facility. Uh, I thought this was Africa. But uh, when I wrote back to my family and I said that, you know, you can even have a cup of coffee at 120 kilometers an hour on the road. They said, what? 120? What are you doing at that speed? In India, that was unbelievable. I mean, if you do 60 or 80, did 60 or 80 kilometers an hour in those days, it was quite like speeding. So I think uh, we, we had to figure our way around. And, uh, Indian business also had to kind of figure out how and where we fitted in the market. So it was a very interesting uh, journey, I would say, from a personal as well as from a business point of view to adapt to a completely new reality of which we had not much uh, first hand information. The internet was there, but it wasn't to the extent how it is today. So, you know, we had to figure a lot of things out by just networking and meeting people and taking the hard knocks. And same thing, I think, for Dixita as well, in a way. I think um, the 90s wave of uh, liberalization in India necessitated in us that we needed to get global exposure and experience. And uh, when, therefore, when we moved here, I at least came in with a clean slate, a clean slate saying that I'm here just to learn from another country. And uh, gradually over 20 years, that clean slate has South Africa written all over it. So I think South Africa grew on us. It's a hidden diamond, it has unique offerings, which we can talk about. And um, it, it's also uh, South Africa, uh, the, the unique offering is it's like a hidden gem working efficiently in very outcomes driven ways at, at an economic level, at that broad overall economic level. So it was a very interesting laboratory uh, to experiment in. That's so unique, man. <laughs> you have a way with words, ma'am. So the next question, 
we have never heard this answer from a woman's perspective before. So please, you take this question first. You stay in SA as a family. When you first came down, did your family love it here? We are curious, as people who live and work here now, how would you rate South Africa? Yes, as I said, we both came in independently. So, uh, and then uh, our daughter moved here at 10 months age. age. So she's practically, uh, she's brought up with a, uh, with a dual mindset, both India, she sees herself as Indian and South African. But for us, we came here, as I said, we, we saw the uniqueness on offer. We saw that it was a it was an economy which was working effectively in an outcome based way, and it was a grad, uh, continuous learning experience. And therefore, what uh, uh, was important for me as as a labor economist, uh, for, uh, an empirical labor economist, I could see that some of the abstract uh, principles were actually working in an economy. So we only studied that in a uh, an abstract way, but when you come here and see it working, oligopolistic market structures, labor migration, and then you are able to test out hypotheses of tripartite growth models, and then you feel that, hang on, here's a laboratory where I can experiment with. And uh, it uh, motivated us to stay on and grow professionally. And then coming back to the Gandhian roots, the historical links, I think there's an indebtedness uh, that we recognize as Indians and we we like to live in Durban as a result and Durban indeed is the warmest place to be. Absolutely and uh, I know it's bizarre but it's the first time in an interview that I understand every single thing you're saying. I have a love of economics and maybe we should get together on another side note. So next question uh, and what about South Africa as a business destination? How would you rate SA as a business destination in terms of opportunities? And what do you see in the, what do you foresee for this country in the near future? Uh, without repeating, I would really like to stress that we see the historical friendship, the shared history first, and then the business as being incidental to that friendship. And um, business emerges out, for me, as, as I see business, it emerges out of links between people. As people-to-people -people contacts grow in, uh, towards peaceful coexistence, that's when business happens. So recognizing historical linkages, the edifice of um, peaceful coexistence, that's when business flourishes in mutually respectable ways. So we see the links for business, the opportunities for business as being mutual and symbiotic. Having said that, then we can expand further and say that this business um, ar arises, for example, India in from the 60s or even earlier, probably took a lot of economic development measures uh, towards food security, employment guarantees. And coming here immediately, I realized that the Indian economy was a very robust economy. And South Africa uh, have, was could provide the nurturing ground for some of these economic development interventions that were carried out. And these schemes could be rooted here. And they are being rooted and have been successful as well. There are uh, cases uh, with government which you can take a look. And on the other hand, the, the, conservatory, the conservationist approach of, uh, towards the environment, the clean infrastructure, the healthy way of doing things, uh, is, is could be relevant to India. So it's a two-way street and we need to be mutually mindful of the two-way relationship. Um, and there was a continuous learning process. So on the whole, um, South Africa becomes an attractive uh, investment destination by the virtue of the fact that it is efficient, effective, outcomes driven. Wow. Now, Mr. Padalka right there, I can't get it off my head. He's wearing a beautiful BizFarm logo on his sleeve. So let's talk about BizFarm now. So let's talk about BizFarm. Tell us more about BizFarm and its initiatives. How does BizFarm make a big difference in the lives of South Africa's youth? And we would especially love to know about your youth development program and how it helps make students job ready.
Thanks, Ali. We're going back to the time when we started off as Dr. Padalkar Research Resources. And that was the time when we did a lot of research, mainly on small businesses. The one thing that we could figure out was that most of the small businesses struggled, mainly because they worked from home or they worked from garages or informal kind of places. And as a result of that, they were not able to have the necessary infrastructure to operate in a professional environment or even employ people for that matter. That was the one thought to say, how could we assist small businesses? And I was fond of traveling. We also were going uh, to Sun City. And during one of the stops, we had a stop and we saw a huge field of sunflowers. And I thought to myself, imagine if this field uh, had each sunflower being an entrepreneur, following the sun, which is, of course, the opportunity. How nice would it have been if we had a flower, if we had a farm full of sunflowers? And that's how the name Biz Farm, as in, you know, a farm where you grow businesses came about. It also tied up nicely with the green and gold, which was the color scheme of the South African uh, flag and uh, also the Waka Waka and the 2010 spirit. So it all kind of came together. So we decided to trademark Biz Farm as such. And that's where we realized that you need to have a space outside of the government where small businesses are given the enabling and nurturing environment where they're able to grow. So that's how the journey began. And we started offering office space, uh, Wi-Fi and other similar services. Eventually in the last few years, we realized that one of the biggest barriers to the young people's participation in the economy was not being fully connected to the digital world. And that's when we realized that if young people have to remain competitive and enabled they need to have a good understanding of digital technologies to make the best use of that. So we decided to concentrate on that space because we saw the digital space as a clear enabler for young people. And we have since then focused in that space. You've painted such a pretty picture. I think your name is the most memorable now. It's not going to go out anytime soon. Um, sticking with the youth, uh, you've been a part of many initiatives covering the youth of the country. How do you see the future of South African youth in change in the changing business environment today, especially with the usage of technology in the fourth industrial revolution? Um, talking of the youth, one if we look at South Africa, it's got it always talks about the triple challenges of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Uh, the youth have also in South Africa had to face triple challenges. Now, what are these triple challenges? So when we, uh, we need to first understand diagnosis of the problem is half the solution. So if you diagnose the problem and understand the problem correctly, you can address the challenges that lie in front of you. So what are the three challenges that the youth have been through in South Africa, maybe since the last 20 plus years? One is that there were historical imbalances in the education system, which created an absolute level of uh, chronic skills shortage. Then came in the post-94 transition where South Africa integrated globally and uh, as a result of that there was uh, a relative uh, deficit, uh, scarcity of skills supply because there was a skills drain and also global skills came in at a premium and therefore it created a relative uh, shortage of supply of skills. And then you have COVID. By the time the labor market was uh, in South Africa was stabilizing and uh, bringing about uh, certain interventions to address the youth problems of the youth, you have COVID with certain technological disruption. So now there are these triple challenges that you have to deal with. Uh, there's a slump in demand for skills because of COVID, because of COVID, and then you have the absolute and relative scarcity of uh, high end uh, skills. Uh, due to the two transitions that we talk about. Now, we have to operate our interventions in this setting. Uh, given uh, this setting, South African youth and support from the government, they have responded very well. Uh, there's a lot of uh, programs that have been packaged within policy frameworks, and uh, they are implemented in a time-bound manner. Uh, for example, you have the SMME FAE. Um, which con is conducted by the Ethiopian municipality. And uh, it's been operating, operating for years. And there's on the ground evidence that it is creating an impact. 
so now our interventions operate within this context. So we begin uh, with, uh, first of all, we have to begin with the high school in terms of addressing the dropouts and addressing an entrepreneurial alertness uh, at the high school level, which has happened, uh, we have addressed through high school initiatives, uh, one of them being the Google uh, Digital Literacy Program. Then you come in with uh, addressing a targeted unemployment reduction initiative, addressing labor intensive sectors. So we've come in with a cooperative uh, administration and support measures in the traditional arts and crafts industries. So what, we, what I'm trying to say is we've got to address our interventions at the level at which the, the youth are operating. And we cannot operate at a higher level, even though we might have those tools, but we've got to talk to the youth and their language at their level and provide effective role models. What this form does is it houses SMEs. So we probably, uh, at any given time, you would have at least 30 SMEs interacting with us. What, when the youth come to us, they are able to engage with the SMEs. This serves not just for incubation of SMEs, but incubation of the ideas for the youth in terms of what kind of businesses they want to get involved in. And then their process starts of implementing that idea into a sustainable business. So there are various levels of interventions that we uh, talk. One of them was also for graduates, unemployed graduates, where we hosted them for probably two weeks to begin with. And then they stayed with us and we had a, a schedule, a weekly schedule of developing a list of soft skills for them. Because the most important challenge for the youth, the educated youth, uh, in general and in South Africa in particular, is that there's a gap between your tertiary education and what the world of work wants. Now, the world of work, which is industry, cannot train the youth. They don't have the time to train the youth coming out of the tertiary institutions. So none, neither the tertiary institutions are able to solve, address the problem of the youth as they are getting into the world of work. You need an intermediary who understands quality outcomes in both these spaces, which is your tertiary, understand the mindset of the tertiary institutions as well as the mindset of industry. I think this farm is able to play that role of the, uh, the intermediary by uh, creating value through support and developing insights in the process of implementation of these support interventions. And when you create such uh, value um, uh, in terms of knowledge is created, because remember when you are incubating youth, you're creating uh, case studies, it's knowledge creation. And that knowledge has to be processed, to be documented with universities. And it is copyrighted at the end of it. So it's, it's, a, it's as I said, it's a laboratory where you are testing out uh, interventions you are creating knowledge because in a knowledge intense economy and you're able to create document that knowledge uh, with universities which are storehouses of knowledge that was very detailed and so so interesting now my next question actually was about equip equipping south african youth with digital skills especially the google certified thing that you touched upon in the last answer so I'm going to change the question around a little bit. I will continue with your change of th chain of thought right now, where you said you were bridging the gaps between the businesses, what the businesses want and what comes out of the tertiary education system, right? The question is this, uh, do you have a system in place to tie up the out uh, outcome that comes up from one and the requirement that comes out from the other in a way that you are bridging that gap even in a tangible manner, like giving people jobs, the people that you've trained? Sure. So, Saili, when we see an unemployed young person or a person who's straight out of, fresh out of college, what we find that is that he may have a certificate, but the ability to apply the knowledge is what the industry expects out of that person. So it starts with something really basic. And it probably starts off by getting that person to become interview ready as a, as a simple way of starting. So the classic method for what we, uh, how we follow it is we ask the people to develop, we ask the students to develop uh, presentations and present themselves in a more proficient and uh, professional way. 
Many of them do not have English as their first language. So speaking, in, speaking properly in English itself for them in many cases becomes a challenge. But when they practice their you know, elevated speech reasonably well enough, they can pretty much answer the most uh, frequently asked questions without any hesitation, simply because they've been drilled on and on and on until they are very proficient about them. So that's the first thing that we do. We get them to present themselves professionally and, prof and, and very well at that. Second is we instill in them a sense of discipline, which is what the workplace expects of them, which means you can't sit anywhere, you can't sit anyhow, you have to talk and behave in a professional way, you have to interact with your colleagues in a professional way, you can't treat this as a family or as a school and take a very lackadaisical approach, being on time is important and all of these things. Now, if this person went into the real world of work, they would have the first penal kind of consequences. But when they go through this farm, you know, they learn it, but in a not very difficult way. Once that is done, then we ask them to say, uh, we ask them to find a very specific area where they are able to excel. As we speak, Saili, and I'm hoping to see this tomorrow, the first thing we said to some of our interns who were very good and who, who expressed a lot of interest in digital marketing, we said to them, take a normal, simple cell phone and make a video promotional one minute clip on BISPA. Can you do that for me? And they said, yes. And they all got together to work as a team. Now, teamwork is not something which is normally what our education does, except for syndicates or some simple thing, but not so much in school work, for example. So they all came together and they put together a video. So they have now been able to do pretty much similar to what you would be doing and putting a small promotional video for this farm. But once they've done, we've given them a license to make all the mistakes along the way. Slowly they will improve, slowly they will become more efficient and slowly they will have a marketable skill where they can go to a small business and say that, can we do a promotional video for you at a very good and a low price? And obviously the small business cannot normally afford that elsewhere if they did it professionally. But if they did it from these people, these students, they would obviously not only be giving them an opportunity, but also help them to stimulate a business opportunity that if they could provide this service, it is something that that can be done on a scalable basis, on a repeatable basis. And that's basically what makes these youngsters employable. It's a shift of mindset and it, and a, transition to market related skills in what the business wants. Now, this is not what they studied, but this is what they can deliver to earn a living. And I think that's the difference that we are trying to make to these young people. This is so phenomenal, sir. You're, there are so many of us, we studied the theory, we don't know the practical. And so many of us who have our certificates, have our degrees, but we are working somewhere totally different because we were not job ready. So this is phenomenal. This is absolutely phenomenal. And anyone who has uh, this dilemma will appreciate that. So uh, now uh, you are turning job seekers into entrepreneurs in a way. That's what we got even in the last answer, right? So let's shift focus from students to aspiring entrepreneurs now. How does this farm help on aspiring entrepreneurs? What would be the process to follow if someone who wishes to approach you for your assistance comes to you? What, what would the process be? By and large, we have two or three different areas of people approaching. One is, of course, digitally, they've heard about this one. The second uh, client that we have is people who are already uh, businesses uh, and they're looking for some kind of a hold because they, they're not able to survive in the actual commercial space because they don't have the resources to pay commercial rents for offices and uh, they they probably you see south africa's again you have to go back to the history is spatial there is spatial segregation because of townships and uh, other, other, other non-township areas so uh, economic activity happens largely in uh, the urban setting and the, the townships where the youth reside are far flung now the youth have to transport themselves on a daily basis from far-flung townships into, uh, say, hubs of economic activity. So they would like to have some hold in a Durban CBD or any business district. Um, uh, where, and they also need accommodation with it. They need a mentorship together with it. They, and they basically brought, they need sharing and caring. At the end of the day, this venture is about the willingness to share 
and the willingness to care for the people who are not able to fend for themselves in an absolute commercial setting. And therefore, when the, the youth come to us, they say, I need office space, but I can't pay you this much, which is what your uh, 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 charges are. We, we have to be accommodating. They, they say, I can pay you, but I can't pay your deposit. I, I, can, I can pay you, but I can't pay on the first. We've got to bend the rules. And if you are not bending the rules for them, uh, then you're like just any other person. And this one's uniqueness comes from the ability to not follow market principles. If you see a genuine person uh, who's in need of assistance in their entrepreneurial venture. So when they come to us, we've got to accommodate their requests. We've got to bend over backwards sometimes. And if we see that there's a need to play the stick, we've got to do that at times. And we have done it at times. And the beauty of this playing the stick when people are not able to, let's say, pay for your service, not just pay for your services or even follow norms of discipline that are required of an entrepreneur. We found that when we played the stick, they come back to us. They say, it was actually good for me that you made me self-disciplined in my cash flow. And I therefore, I want to come back to you. I'm sure I'm, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, the, so you have that category of the youth that come to you who already have an entrepreneurial nature. And then you may have tertiary institutions and corporates, both of whom uh, have interacted with us. We have partnership or in whatever you want to call the memorandum of understanding where they've said that we want you to scale up our youth, our suppliers, our in, uh, in, um, and make them business ready or more than ready, sustainable. And so that they are able to operate in a proper market setting. The problem is of the youth is that the, uh, and South Africa coming back is that the, the youth are not able to operate in a market setting because of historical reasons. And we've got to bring in that enabling factor. So it's a unique earnest uh, of the individual that we have to support. So we, as I said, we have three categories. One, the, the one who come to us digitally on their own. The second who are in a problem and come to us for support by word of mouth. And the third who come through tertiary and corporate sector. And how do we go about assisting? We have a full-fledged office uh, support through our office administration, our interns who've been actually, when, when interns come to us with, uh, when they are supported by government uh, assistance programs to be based with us, they actually spend a week or so understanding the process of how to assist clients that come to us. Would you like to add anything, sir? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the commonly held beliefs amongst entrepreneurs is that office space costs a lot of money. And that's one of the mental barriers which kind of hold people back from, you know, getting into formal office space. So we actually offer office space for free. And the free is basically how it works is that we ask people to put in a small deposit. And if they use the office every week for a month, then they get their money back. But generally speaking, we've never found anybody asking their money back because after having been there, they say, no, I like what I, I'm, I'm here. It's a nice community kind of an environment. I spend say about 400, 500 rands on just buying mobile data. It's costing us a lot of money, but you know, it's much easier for me because I get to meet a lot of people. I get to have an office space, a boardroom, meet with, uh, uh, you know, live in a social environment, get the data for free. Uh, get away from home or get away from anywhere that I want to not be too long for. And that works for them. And then eventually they figure out um, whatever is the best package that works for them. Everybody likes a quiet office space to work, work from, you know. And that's basically what we offer. But then eventually when we connect them with other corporates, it brings more business opportunities for them. And I think that's where the business really starts to grow. So when we say this farm, we say we grow entrepreneurs. And we've got to find different creative ways in which how we can grow their businesses. That's what we are all about. And we are all falling in love with this farm now. It's a business with a heart also. So, so suppose someone has an interesting business idea. What process do you follow when assessing the feasibility of the idea in the first place? Yeah, uh, Saili, I think in the last few years, uh, startups have become a science in itself. Earlier, it was pretty much of a random kind of a thing. Uh, we have now 
established a whole process and a set of tools which enable a startup to become more structured. So, for example, we you know have a business model canvas, a value proposition canvas. We ask people to have a fair amount of robust interactions with customers because at the end of the day for a business, it's not about the idea, but the ability to have a paying customer. And when they realize that there's a big difference between a dream and an idea and a vision or, a, uh, or an ambition, the reality is cash flow at the end of the day. And if you, if you can't convert your business into cash flow, and if you don't know the steps in between, then you don't really have a business. It's just a, a wild dream. So I think that process is where we really walk them step by step uh, to build a whole funnel. And that's eventually what starts building the business. Of course, we use a lot of tools like growth wheel, for example, which allow them to get themselves more disciplined, which allows them to take the correct decisions and implement them into actions. So execution is critical and they understand that it's not about philosophy or about politics or about anything of, of race or gender or anything. Business is about money. It's about simple principles and execution is what matters. So when they are in an environment where these values are prized and are different from those values which in the outside society do not exist in that sense they really start seeing the difference and you know then then that starts creating the environment which makes everybody follow that sort of a disciplined environment they see that nobody's sitting and wasting their time everybody's doing their own thing and is very focused on that so the objective is to get them focused simply as that so in that answer you gave us our first twitter quote for promotions, which was, it's not about the idea, it's about the ability to get paying clients. So awesome. Uh, does this sorry, fund undertake, yeah? Sorry, sorry, if I may add, you, you asked about feasibility, right? How do you know that? See, yeah. I, per, uh, I think one must understand that there's nothing, it's not about the feasibility of the idea, it's about the implementation. So you can't say that a particular idea, if somebody comes to you with the idea, you cannot dismiss a person and say that it's not feasible. You've got to ask, how well are you going to be able to implement? So the true test of an idea is, it's in, is in its uh, mission-based precise implement, mission mode precise implementation. So business plans, feasibilities, annual financial statements, these are tools that have been used also, one must understand as exclusionary tools, we've got to make these tools work. I'm not saying the tools are wrong, but I'm saying these tools have to work at inclusion, not at exclusion. Therefore, there's nothing as an unfeasible idea. It's all about the quality of the implementation that comes. I really should have sat down with my notepad. You're giving quotable tweets like it's flowing tweets here. I love that. I love that idea that it should be about inclusion and not about exclusion. Um, so, uh, ma'am, does BizFarm undertake venture capital investments or angel investments on its own? Or does it have any tie-ups with local South African firms and banks with, for new entrepreneurs struggling with getting finance? I always believe that finance is the oxygen of the business and therefore it's that it's for that reason that there's so many businesses that are lacking finance because the moment you stop that oxygen you're actually using exclusion so when we are able to br bring that oxygen into a, a business um, those businesses prosper now we have our uh, accredited uh, means through which we can lend and uh, there are also institutions that uh, do the lending professionally. Till now, I would say that we uh, we've not uh, really put our uh, the same our lump sum behind businesses. We actually enable businesses to obtain finance. But here again, um, when it comes to the sustainability of a startup, it's always less about getting additional finance and more about getting the first client you see the clients bring in your finance so uh, very often this whole startup dialogue is about startup venture capitalism is about finance whereas actually it's about market access but i think yeah to answer your simple question firstly Saivi, uh 
Dr. Padalkar's research resources is a registered credit provider, NCRCP 7513. So we have a banking license, technically speaking. It allows us to charge a uh, prime plus a certain significant amount of interest, which can classify us almost as a loan shark. And this was our way of finding a legal means of uh, funding businesses. Our initial thought was that we should approach, uh, we should follow a Grameen bank kind of a funding business model. But within the legal framework, the national credit regulator, uh, we found that this method of becoming a credit provider was the more legal method of doing it. It of course took us a lot of time and effort to get this license, which basically means that we can invest, we can loan and we can lend money. But on a more practical basis, we first make sure that the business itself is fundable and it's funding ready. Now that's a whole journey which we need to put in place. That means if the order book is good, your money is good. And in that sense, we don't directly invest in businesses in cash, but there are many other intangible ways in which we support businesses, which make them fundable and scalable. So I hope that answers the question. Completely. You even added some extra that we didn't know about. That's awesome. So a vast majority of startups fail to go past their first year. What advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs who are held back due to statistics like these and many more? Absolutely, uh, you're quite right. You know, 90% of the businesses will fail in the first three years and at least 60 to 70% will fail in the first one or two years. And the main reason is because they make something that the market doesn't want. And that's what I always talk about starting with a dream business. Now, the dream business is okay up to a point, but it's only when that business has some degree of traction that it's viable and scalable and sustainable. So the main journey or the main task in an incubator is to get that business to that point. And therefore, I think for a business which is in the startup stage to validate their business model is something very, very important. And that cannot happen in your mind because your business is not your business. It's your customer's business. You've got to understand what is it that your customer wants. And that's what's going to shape the size and shape of your business, which means you've got to spend, let's say, 80 to 90 percent of your time, face time with your customers more than what you spend in your own mind. Now, get out of the building, talk to your customers, get thrown out if that's what it takes. But you will know probably the hard way. What is it that the market wants? What is it that the market is prepared to pay for? And can you produce and deliver those goods? If you can do that, then obviously, that will reduce the fatality rate of any startup. So validate your business idea and that's what will make it more sustainable. There is so much going on in this interview. I can't wait to meet you in person. There's so many tricks you can teach me that I can learn from you. Uh, but ma'am, what are your thoughts now? Uh, do you think South Africa has the potential to become a startup hub for Africa? Um, these are days of where the local economy is a star. So we've got to enable the youth to empower themselves and their local economies. So this, when you talk of startups, we've got to talk of startups as small hubs, micro hubs across South Africa or across Africa. And therefore, it's not the startup, South Africa being the startup hub, it's about Africa having lots of micro hubs with micro startups that are working by the youth themselves and who are empowering themselves and their neighborhoods. So, so it's about facilitating local economic development through the startups. Now, Africa has the opportunity, uh, let, let's talk South Africa and Durban has the opportunity to be get more surreal and more specific, has the opportunity to leapfrog itself into the fourth industrial revolution or what as more commonly can be called as a knowledge economy. Because of uh, the historical factors again, they can skip a step in their industrial evolution and move into cleaner, greener digital technologies uh, uh, faster and uh, as a result you they, they could take a lead in the knowledge economy and when you 
are able to uh, facilitate that, uh, that uh, uh, in order to do that, you've got to first explain the concept of a knowledge economy. Now, the Google program did that. We, took, we broke down the basics of a digital economy and explained how the knowledge economy is going to, is works and, and what kind of change is about to be coming. Therefore, the, you, the people who attended the program understood that there was a digital disruption that was coming. And if you see post COVID, South African businesses have responded very well to digitized models. They haven't fumbled in with the onslaught of digital uh, post COVID. Um, when, when you talk of again, becoming a startup hub, uh, we've got to, uh, when it is able to uh, evolve, uh, skip that uh, step in its industrial evolution, what happens is that uh, South Africa immediately develops a comparative advantage in the knowledge economy. And the, the, therefore, as to uh, uh, to address your uh, question, as can does it have the potential to be a startup hub? Yes, it does, but not in the way it's generally understood. But as a lot of micro hubs operating throughout Africa, where they have moved ahead and developed a comparative advantage and leapfrog into a knowledge economy. Now that is of course easier said than done, because remember you're operating from a chronic shortage of skills supply. And uh, that is also, uh, is, is, is not for the faint hearted to, to do this is not for the faint hearted to be able to achieve this from a low skill base and to become a knowledge competitive economy in the digital era is of course easier said than done. So while the, in the few, it may look positive, it may look bright, it may look that there are positive test cases on the ground, to do that in re reality is uh, a long-term vision. Yeah, true that. Uh, what would you advise a budding entrepreneur? Now it's time to spill the secrets, right? What areas do you think are the best to explore at this current time? The most workable, the most magical niche areas? Simple, the future is digital and there's so many opportunities in, in digital, it's unbelievable. And I don't have to convince the converted like yourself and like Piyush, for example. But uh, Saini, I think this is something which I think very often we traditionally have seen entrepreneurs, you know, they tend to start off in businesses which have a fairly low entry barrier. What is a lower than digital kind of a business with a lower entry barrier than that? I mean. All you basically need is a good laptop connectivity. You're in business. Simple as this. And that's something which let's say somebody who's worked in a corporate already has access to. What they've not applied this to is how to use these simple devices and their experience and their mindset into a revenue creating business. And I think that's where the opportunity sits because digital is huge. You know that digital has so many niches. Digital has so many gaps. I mean, it's like what we say, uh, there's a skill shortage on one hand and there's a large unemployed people's pool on the other hand. Now, are we not connecting the two poles of a positive and a negative coefficient of this battery? So the future is digital. And I think if somebody really wants to get onto this, the opportunities are huge and immense. That's that's my one piece of simple advice. Just to add to that, um, okay. may, I? may I? Yes, of course, of course, please. Uh, to be very precise, I think this, this helps uh, tertiary institutions, local governments and industry. To be very precise, to answer that, what sectors should the youth uh, think? It should be grassroots innovations, supply chain competitiveness in manufacturing and agriculture, backed by tertiary and health sectors. So that's the broad statement that we've got to keep in mind. Supply chain competitiveness, uh, grassroots innovation in manufacturing and agriculture backed by tertiary sectors, especially health, through a digitized enabler. Brilliant and most comprehensive. So we've picked your brains enough for today. I want to know about your private moments. Uh, let's have some lighthearted questions now to end this interview on a more endearing note. What do you say, sir? Ma'am? All yours. yours. Super. So, Mr. and Mrs. Padalkar, how do you spend your leisure time? 
assuming you have any left after you wear so many hats every day. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this if I say this, but well, I have to say it is that the way you spend your time and you study economics, right? Yes, economics and finance. Yeah, so the way you spend your time between work and leisure should be su such that you are able to spread your time across a diverse range of activities and maximize your satisfaction from all of them. Get the most maximum, uh, like marginal utility, right? Don't let yeah. it dip. <laughs> <laughs> super, super. So what do you like to do? Do you like to travel? What, what is it that you, or you like to eat out, try new restaurants? What do you do, sir? All of the above. We like to have fun. And if I've given you the impression that we work very hard, that's not necessarily true. Uh, Dikshita pretty much works from home. I go to the office probably about three or four hours a day max. Um, and yeah, I think the, the beauty of being in a business like this is having a great team with you. And the best part is that the team is able to do most of the work. All we need to really do is make sure the ship stays on course, stays on track, does the right things and is working smoothly. That's basically it. If you make sure that happens, everything goes fine. And then the rest is all your own time. So, you know, Quality of life is something which is something that comes after about seven to 10 years in a business. The first five years are an absolute sweatshop. But once that is done, once you put the systems and processes and everything else in place, all the time is yours. So, you know, we, we, we have a lot of leisure time. We love to travel. And uh, I mean, we've seen practically all of South Africa by work as well as for fun. And we love traveling. So. We are all very geared up for that at any time. You know, give us 20 minutes and we'll be out. Simple. That's fantastic. And South Africa is the biggest tourist destination. So that's like a bonus, the cherry on top. So uh, you have said you've traveled all across South Africa. So you must have seen all of the amazing places and the things to do and everything. So tell us about your favorite travel experiences here, like a favorite road trip or a favorite safari, whatever. Oh, so many. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, there's lots, but I think the moment when we enjoyed the, the Soccer World Cup, the country come alive during the Soccer World Cup, I think that's one of the most memorable uh, moments. And we traveled during that time to various uh, stadia and witnessed a few matches. I think the reason we enjoyed that moment is that in in a in a brief uh, uh, span of space of two to three weeks, South Africans were able to push aside all these stresses and strains in their relationships and just come together as a country to enjoy the best sporting event in the world. I think to see them just give up their their grudges or their daily stresses and unite. I think that was a moment which has stayed with us um, and the 21, 2010 Soccer World Cup uh, travel during that time was lovely. Absolutely. But let me let you in on one more secret. And I think you're probably into it already that with COVID, some of the best deals available on town uh, in, in, in the tourism industry are really up there for picking. So, you know, if you're brave enough uh, and actually, you know, the, the far away travel destinations are some of the safest destinations. So if you get out there and spend some time, you'll not only be able to continue to do what you need to do, but uh, you'll also have a fantastic deal. And, and this is a great time to travel, I would think. I'm surprised why not enough people are not traveling. I agree with you there. Once you get the two shots, you should be out. Uh, yep. But I'm known to throw a few googlies at all. So here's your googly. Why Durban? Well, we landed into Durban mainly because of our work, but I think if I look at it from a point of uh, as an Indian expat, Durban offers probably the best of what India offers as well as what South Africa offers. So in that sense, it's best of almost every world that you can think of. And until recently, a direct flight to Dubai uh, and hopefully a direct flight to India would really, you know, make the deal full complete. So Durban has probably the best of what a metro can do and the nearest equivalent I can think. And if you're a Punekar, you know what I'm talking about. Durban is the Pune of uh, South Africa. 
See, now I don't feel so bad that I stay in Joburg, but my heart is in Durban, right? You, you gave me the perfect backing. I'm a Pune girl. Of course, I'm going to love Durban. <laughs> so that's it from me for today. I cannot believe how much fun it was to chat with both of you today. We got to learn so much. Sure. Sally, uh, I want to also thank you. You know, your very bubbly way of interviewing did not put us into a kind of a tight spot at any any point. We enjoyed because it was more of a family conversation than anything else. And because all three of us know each one of us fairly well by now, it was more of a, you know, fireside kind of a chat than an interview. So thank you very oh, much for this thank opportunity you. to bring us as well. Thank you so very much. These words are priceless. Yeah, thank you. And from ourselves, Namaskar and Jai Hind, obviously. With this, we wrap up our seventh episode of Pursuit of Excellence. I'd like to thank our amazing guests who take the time to chat with us. I'd also like to thank the Consulate General of India in Durban, Honorable Sri Anish Rajan, who made this series possible. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today, like you do every month. Thank you and see you again soon with yet another exciting guest Hopefully another female, but let's see. Thank you and namaste.